The Cube at OpenStack Summit Atlanta 2014 is brought to you by Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. And Red Hat. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, welcome back everyone here live in Atlanta for the OpenStack Summit. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I join my co-host Stu Miniman, analyst at wikibon.org. And our next guest is Dave Meyer, CTO and Chief Science at, at uh, Brocade. Welcome back uh, to theCUBE. It's great to be here with you guys. Um, good to see you again. So I got I to talk to you about what's going on at OpenStack. Obviously, you know, you guys are amazing technology. We, we had you on theCUBE before, you're going in depth and geek, geeking out. What are you hearing right now from customers relative to the viability of OpenStack and, and where are they in the life cycle of adoption? And that's what everyone wants to know about. You know, our customers are telling us that they really want to go to the OpenStack open source world. That's really, really a major trend and everybody wants to go there. I think that, I, you know, what's happening too is that it, it's becoming closer and closer to reality, I think, for everyone. You know, in the early days of OpenStack, it was you know, it was difficult and, and it was a, a, a rapidly maturing open source project, but now even the tooling of, around uh, distributions and around uh, deployment is becoming open source. So this is all, uh, this is all going to become, it, the parts of it that aren't already real are going to become real um, quickly. And I don't know if you guys sat in on uh, John Brzezowski's talk uh, from Comcast yesterday, but he, he said that they, they can figure all their set-top boxes with OpenStack in the US, X, Xfinity boxes. So you think about that. That's, that's a large, large number of devices that they're configuring. So that's a real deployment, and it's at a very large scale. So there, you know, there's a lot of real deployment out there right now. What are some of the things going on? We heard you know, some articles about Neutron and the network layer, and the virtualization is certainly changing the game. There's a lot of action going on, on the network side. Um, and how does that impact some of the customer pain points around OpenStack? Because the OpenStack is a platform. There's a lot of things up the stack, down the stack. You know, below, at the, at the lower end of the stack, what are the key challenges that you see and pain points with customers? Yeah, so um, the relationship between uh, the network layer and OpenStack is really shaking out and getting is solidifying right now, and, and being part of the Open Daylight um, project, you know, we kind of interact with OpenStack on that layer, right? So the question of how much network configuration and things go into Neutron versus how much go into a control, tro controller layer that sits underneath that, but that is really shaking out right now. And so I think that what, what you're going to see is you're going to see these um, really robust virtualization technologies in the open source community that are comprised of these layered architectures, OpenStack, Open Daylight. So Dave, uh, we were talking to Neela before about how OpenStack and Open Daylight are, are coming together. It was good to see OpenStack you know, opening up to other open source projects. Uh, understand you had a birds of a feather here looking into ODL. Uh, say for, I think it was like two hours at the end of the day and you still had you know, good discussion. So can you give us a little, little insight as to you know, w w what's everybody saying there? Um, with respect to Open Daylight? Yeah, ODL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the one thing I can say right away is that the OpenStack community is very interested in Open Daylight. Um, I had a, a session today, Kyle um, Mystery, who's the uh, Neutron uh, PTL, and I had this uh, thing about how, um, this session about how OpenStack and um, Open Daylight are co-evolving together, because Neutron, uh, there's a Neutron plug-in in Open Daylight right now. So, you know, OpenStack and Open Daylight work very well together right now, and, uh, you know our customers and the communities that we're that we're involved in are really really excited about this because the amount of knowledge of network knowledge and network infrastructure that's in Open Daylight really augments OpenStack. Yeah. So people are excited about that. So so, so Dave, uh, you know. We're glad to have Brocade here as a sponsor. You know, we've seen you guys hiring a lot of people that, that are involved in Open Daylight and OpenStack. Can you give us a little insight as to you know what what, what you're doing with the team and yeah. you know some of the key people that you've hired and, and you know where are you hiring more? Sure. Um, so when I came to Brocade, I think it was like 16 months ago. Um, I wanted to build an open source team, a real you know a, one of the kind of open source teams that would not only drive uh, innovation into the open source projects, but would really be active in the community because. Um, I think I, I, I talked about this a little bit last time, but the community is really what it's about, and, and it's where, that's where the innovation comes from. 
and Chris Wright has talked about this a lot, you know, that it's, it's innovation through collaboration through this community. And I, I wanted my company to be part of that. So, we, so you know, I had some friends, uh, folks I've known for many years through IETF experiences and things like that, who, um, you know, were looking around for just that kind of opportunity. Um, Benson Schiller, Tom Nadeau, um, Colin Dixon. And, you know, it all came together with support from uh, executive level at Brocade. And, you know, we, we built a, uh, you know, I've seen a couple of things in the press where it's been called a dream team. It's not done yet, but it's, it's I'm really happy about it. Yeah, you gotta be careful. I remember the Eagles came out and talked about their dream team behind the season and it didn't work out so well. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, Brocade's had, you know, long leadership in, uh, you know, networking standards. You think about IETF, you know, I, I know when I, I, I know some of the guys inside Brocade that are working on, you know, the next speed bump of, of Ethernet, you know, 400 gig and, yeah. and beyond. So, uh, you, executive support, uh, you know, is, is open source, you know, how, how important is that on, uh, on Brocade's, uh, you know, top list? It's extremely important, and you know, one of, one, one of the things I'm really gratified by is that you know, those, you know, the company gets that, and, and that's reflected in the fact that we've hired this this crew, right? And we're it's not done yet. I mean, we're just, you know, we're just getting going here with this, and and, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to do. Now, we have we have a pretty good team, it's and it's come together pretty nicely. But at the end of the day, it's sort of like the you know, you know, eagles or whatever. You still have to execute. Yeah. yeah, you still have to. Execute. So, so you know, w what's new with Brocade and OpenStack this year? What are you guys showing off? How does it fit into the portfolio? What what solutions are you driving? And you know, you can, we'll we'll dig into the partnerships after that too. Yeah, there 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 were a couple of nice demos done by Brocade folks here. One was integration of OpenStack with VCS, the Fabric products. Really nice way of configuring uh, VCS through OpenStack, not using Open Daylight. And then there were a couple of other really nice demos of the integration of the Viata 5600, which is software router, Open Daylight, and OpenStack. And so we, we've showed a lot of these kind of solutions, and um, those kind of solutions are really getting much more robust, much more functional, at a, just an incredible rate. So I expect to see uh, products that are bundled, of, you know, bundle, all three of those products bundled together in the very near future. Yeah, so we heard uh, AT&T gave a presentation in one of the keynotes talking about NFV, so, uh, you know, wh where, does, where does Viata fit into the whole OpenStack mix then? Um, yeah, so in the NFV case, so Viata is perfect for NFV, right? right. It's, it's, it's the NFV set of use cases, which include like so sort of virtual routers, ADXs, load balancers, all of these things, it's the perfect solution for that. And it's also, um, it also can, you know, forwarding high, you know, high forwarding performance in software. That's that's one of the problems that we've been working out in NFE. So, and NFE is looking towards open source. So that's that that universe of things is really coming together right now. Okay, uh, one of the one of the hot topics of where we kind of need open sector grow has been in the management space. Can, can you skip it your insight as to you know where that's going and you know where, where does Brocade sit in that discussion? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, one well, one thing that I noticed this time is that what used to be proprietary management tools, because one of the problems with OpenStack was there was, a, there was a business that was associated, that people were in, that was associated with the fact that there were so many, there were different OpenStack distros and they were hard to get going. So you had, you, you had management products that would, you know, would address that. And a lot, of, a lot of the management infrastructure is now going into open source. So that will start accelerating as well in the same way that, that OpenStack and Open Daylight are. Okay. So I can, I can see this, I can, I can see this acceleration going up and down through the whole stack. So uh, you know, one, one of the feedbacks we've gotten from people at, at, at this show is that Neutron still needs some work to get done. I want to get your viewpoint on that is, you know, you know how does this get solved? You know, who, what needs to happen to, to really, you know, solidify and uh, have, you know, good performance and uh, good scalability and reliability out of networking uh, in an open stack environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Neutron, Neutron's, um, you know, kind of, gelling right now too, but there's still a, there's still this, I would, I would say there's, there's diversity of thought there of course, but the main schism I would say is how much Neutron is going to know about the details of the network. So, and you can think about this sort of, how much of a controller are you going to build into Neutron? And that's the real, that's the real battleground right now, or the real, the real place where the, uh, at least the architectural thinking is going on. Um, so my, my sense of that is I think Neutron will eventually, it'll eventually shake out that um, Neutron will talk to Open Daylight for the detailed fine-grained management of the, of the of devices and, and uh, at the Neutron level you'll be doing orchestration. 
So on the multi-vendor thing, a lot of people are saying that it's good, it was centered around Nasira. I mean, is that a problem or is that going to change, do you think? Um, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by centered around Nasira. Well, I, I think that, you know, Neutron started with Nasira oh, code. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, sure, okay. Um, no, I don't think that's going to be a problem because, you know, also, as, as these projects um, evolve, mature, even though code started, like a lot of the open, open daylight code started in Cisco, right? But it's matured in such a way that uh, that's, a, that's a distant lineage, you know, and, and, you know, it'll evolve and mature and people will uh, create the kind of infrastructure that they want based on what people are interested in and what they want to do. So the fact that it originated anywhere, I don't think it's really a big problem. So a lot of the developers here are looking for the project, and a lot of, we heard from the Rackspace guy earlier, um, the CTO, John and Gates, saying, you know, the developer, you can't tell developers what to work on, especially in the open source. You go where the action is and where the value is. What are you seeing for stuff here at the event that's on your radar that may or may not have been on your radar before? Is there anything, any conversations, any uh, developer action happening that gets uh, getting your attention? Oh, there's so many things. I, you know, one, one of the main things that's really I mean, I had this idea before, but um, the fact that the barrier to entry is so low um, to, to, you know, to build a startup or to do whatever you want is effectively zero, right? I mean, you, know, you don't need infrastructure, you get it on AWS or whatever. You don't need, you can get knowledge on demand because the community is so much about teaching the other members of the community. So not only is the infrastructure not an issue, not only is acquiring the knowledge not an issue, but there's energy, so basically the the barrier to entry to innovate in this in this community has gone to zero, so that's a big thing. Um, and then the second thing is that I've been noticing is that I've I've had this idea that things are accelerating in a in a in a really uh, dramatic way, and it's catching that acceleration that people are looking at. And so you see a lot of projects and a lot of different um, kinds of uh, interesting. Um, uh, versions of the same ideas in different places because it's easier to do, it's getting progressively easier to do. So that's, those are kind of the two main things. And then the third thing I would say is that, and I've said this in a various different ways, but I mean, my, I compile it down into saying something like, what you build isn't as important as how you build it anymore. And that's the same as, I forget whose keynote this was, but he said there's the good, fast, cheap triangle is now the fast, fast, fast triangle. That's the same thing. You know, so the, the, the it's like the, all of this has conspired to create the, the, the advantage that if it is all wrapped up in the acceleration and how fast you can go. And that's, that's something we haven't seen. So what's new from uh, Brocade this year uh, uh, in, and around, in and around OpenStack? And obviously you guys have um, great relationships and talking to some of the partners. You have a good reputation um, and certainly technical company. Um, what are some of the new things around OpenStack that you guys are doing? Well, as I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of integration going on with the VCS product line integration going on with the MLX product line, including you know, uh, things like DDoS protection and things like that are all built on top of this infrastructure. And then we're also making a big push into, into the community itself because that's one of the things I really wanted in, to have happen and one of the reasons we built this team the way we did was we want to be uh, community members and, and this is, helps everybody. It helps Brocade because we, gain, we, we develop expertise and in the core infrastructure that we're building products on top of. And it helps the community because you get, you get developer and committer diversity inside the community. And so those are the kind of things that we're really, really pushing towards. Now on the, on the software product side, um, the, the auto products are all, all I'm looking at talking Neutron to uh, for orchestration as well. So I think we'll, we'll see that coming through all the products. And Heat's gotten a lot of buzz here too, the Heat project. Heat, yeah. As, but we, you know, okay, so Brocade isn't right on Heat yet, but we're looking at it. And the thing is, is that Datalog is, is a language that Heat wants to use for policy, and, and Viata already, the Viata folks already implemented Datalog before Heat came along. So we're kind of well positioned to, to work with Heat. Where's OpenStack headed? From a technical perspective, obviously you're seeing the business momentum, certainly the hype cycle's at the peak right now. You're seeing a, a lot of customers here, operators, developers, but where is OpenStack heading, in your opinion? Where do you see it going? I kind of look at it like, you know, a, a version of the Linux kernel, or, you know, or the kernel, you know, it's core infrastructure. It'll harden, there'll be different distributions, like there are now, and that'll shake out over time, and, you know, it's like, you don't ask, who do you ask these days, like, what, what's going on with your Met, NetBSD laptop, exactly? Well, you don't see that anymore, right? Yeah. So, that's what's going to happen with, 
So ab sections. abstracting away some complexity, hardening some things, and then building on top of it. Yeah, and, th and that's the key thing. Yeah. So, so what advice would you have for a CIO who assembled his you know, network architecture and technical staff as they say, all right, let's go do OpenStack. What advice would you give that CIO and from a pragmatic technical perspective as they start to really think about laying the foundation for a hybrid cloud or a cloud architecture? What, what, what would you, if you could be a consultant to that, to that room of folks, what would you say to them? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, my, my sense of the best thing you can do in this community is become part of it. So if I had a, if I was getting, if I was hiring a dev team, which is what we did, um, I, what I would do is I would, I would have them become part of the community first, become core contributors, become committers on these projects, and then help harden the infrastructure and then build products around. So in the case of OpenStack, they have this really nice idea about core versus ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, becoming expertise, getting expertise in the core piece of it, just like we're trying to get, like we're building expertise in the core of Open Daylight is, is the place to start. It's a community-based thing. I think the power is really there. And then that comes back through, um, through not only expertise, not only um, your visibility in the community and in, with your customers, but also in your ability to make and develop and produce and you know, maintain products. So that's, that's how becoming part of the open source community in a very deep and serious way, I think, would be my first advice. So, so Dave, you know, we talked last time we talked to you about kind of you know, the careers of, of, of network uh, people. Um, you know, so going back to that, you say you know you should get involved in the community. You should do an open source. Um, I mean, it's a significant mind shift for for a lot of people. Um, you know, we we've always said you know if, if your job today is too much configuring you know VLANs and the like, you know you're going to need to change your job. You know, how, how's that been maturing? Uh, you know, you know what is, what, what's the update as do you think? Uh, you know, network engineers and you know the people that you know have been updating their CCIEs for all these years should be thinking about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I have some friends and they're network engineers, right? And I'm, they're always asking me, what, you know, what should I do? And I, I always say, learn how to write code, you know? Learn how to write code. And you know, you don't have to become a developer, but you need to, people in that, in, in that, part, of this, in that, that part of the ecosystem need to at least understand what, what, the, um, what the pieces of this puzzle are for them, you know? And, and I don't think, you know, I really, I think there's some places where that traditional network engineering will survive over time. But I mean, you know, the automation and, and the ability to write new kinds of code are, are, are the things that are going to be the future because you can't even, you know, you can't even imagine a hyperscale data center these days that's not fully automated. You know, there aren't anybody, there's nobody typing on any of that stuff, you know. Yeah, so, you know, Dave, you, you've watched a lot of the changes in the networking industry, and, and, and one of the challenges is it, it takes a long time, you know, uh, you know, you know, how long do you think, you know, it's going to take for, for this kind of, you know, shift to go, uh, you know, you know, open stack and open daylight, uh, you know, before it's a significant part of uh, kind of the IT landscape? I think it's going to happen pretty quickly. Now, I, I will say that I think, you know, open stack's obviously quite a bit more mature than open daylight is. So, you know, that kind of stuff is going to happen quickly. And because services are, are being fielded on open, st open stack right now in various places, public, private, hybrid cloud, and all of that, um, this stuff is going to happen pretty quickly. So I think, and there's another, by the way, there's another dynamic here is that the cost of hosting facilities in the public cloud, because there's price wars and other, other kinds of things, is, is dropping at such a precipitous rate that CIOs actually cannot afford not to do this, right? Cannot afford not to do this. Um, so the people who are in their network engineering staffs are going to have to become facile with this just on the ba on, on economic basis alone. So on the future of um, the contribution side of it, I mean, obviously we were talking with uh, some folks and they're saying, look for some real metrics around market share. It's not more of a business discussion. But right now the metric is con contributing lines of code. Do you see other metrics coming around the corner as this matures, other than you know, lines of code contributed? Um, because you said it's got a nice model, it's got a core, it's got an ecosystem. The governance looks like it's doing really well with, with OpenStack. Um, there's not a lot of mudslinging right now at this point, which one of our concerns coming in was, will there be mudslinging or love fest? It seems like it'd be more of a love fest at this point. Uh, but what, what do you see for the contribution model? Certain metrics, and can the organic community still win with some of these big leaders coming in, like IBM, like HP, like Red Hat doing, doing their thing? So how do they balance 
that piece. So first one is metrics around success around the community, and then has that organic community balance itself with some of the big players. Yeah, so I, I think that, uh, you know, and we've actually, we've, we've kind of explored the first question in Open Daylight a little bit around what are the success metrics for individuals and for the project itself. And, you know, you mentioned lines of code or, you know, number of commits or whatever. We've been trying to, we've been trying to understand if there's a way to enlarge this, the community so that we can bring more people into um, sort of the governance and operation of the project itself. So I, I see, I, I, you know, I think that, you know, things like documentation, always a problem. Things like system test and integration, always a problem. Those people sometimes get left out of the governance, sometimes of the decision making and other things. So I think we'll see an enlargement of that. Um, so that's the first one. And the second question was? The balance between the organic community growth and oh, the big yeah. vendors. Yeah, well, let me, let me take a, a 1.5 question on that. Um, so, <laughs> so if you want to build, so that people just, this is a hard one. If you want to build a vibrant open source community like you have an open stack or you have an open daylight, you need these big personalities, the people who are not only great coders, not, not only really understand the open source um, uh, development methodology and community, uh, but also um, you know, are, part, are, are active in the community. So you know, you have, one of the things I've learned on the TSC is that you have this, you're going to have this interaction between people that has this certain kind of friction, but it's not necessarily bad, it's kind of good because as long as there's mutual respect from, between everybody, you know, the development and engineering um, experience is kind of adversarial, right? You have an idea, I have an idea, I try to convince you, you try to convince me. And I think that, if we can keep that ethic inside open source, it really won't matter um, if the entities are, are big corporate players or, you know, they're individuals or they're, um, or they're smaller corporate, or smaller players. So, and, and we've kind of seen that in OpenStack right now. And Friction with it. mutual respect is a formula for, for progress. Yeah, yeah. So Dave, I want you to do the last question. Share with the audience in your own words. Why is this point in the technology industry so important? You've seen some cycles of innovation. You've seen boom, boom, uh, booms and busts. Why is this point so active? Why are guys our age and the young guns, why is everyone so excited right now? It's, it's Wait a minute, the, guys know. our age? Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, uh, the wrinkles going on here, you know, the yeah, gray yeah. hairs coming in. Yeah. Um, but DevOps is a young culture, I mean, it's a DevOps show, right? So, yeah. but in general, the technology business is changing up and down the stack, there's a radical transformation happening. Why yeah. is it, tell the folks out there in your own words, you know, what that means, that, are, that aren't on inside the, inside the ropes, if you will. Yeah, so, so the reason it's happening in my mind is, one is the, just the rise of software itself, in, you know, and that, that, took, that took Moore's Law and years of these things. But you know, the, the thing that's really driving all of this stuff is that the technology we're building is feeding back to cause this. So for example, you couldn't have DevOps, you couldn't have uh, open source or any of that stuff without the internet because you need the, you need the seamless communication um, just for the operation of the projects themselves, much less the technologies that you build, right? So for example, if you didn't have the network, you couldn't really develop software in this way. So now you have the network, you have the software being developed, and there's a feedback. There, there's all these feedback loops inside here. And so I think that's the key thing, is that there's acceleration in all of these things, making them more accessible to more people at an, at a, at an accelerating rate. And hence, you get a lot of young people. Young, you know, you can become a developer pretty quickly now, because not only because programming languages have been come higher level and they're easier to kind of understand, but also because you have the network with all the resources that you need, including live humans and all of that other stuff. So, you know, I, I mean, that's what's really going on in my mind is that the technology we built fed back on itself to create the environment that we're seeing now. Dave Meyer, CTO, Chief Science of Brocade. Brocade, big presence at the show. Congratulations, uh, good buzz. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.